Hello, welcome everybody to the No Normal Show for Thursday, December 3, 2020, brought to you by Revive Health. This is our weekly deep dive into how hospital and health system marketers can navigate what we are calling the No Normal. I am Chris Bevelo, health systems practice lead at Revive Health and your host for the show. I am joined by Chase Kleckner, who is senior marketing manager at Revive Health and our show's producer. Hello, Chase. Hey, Chris. Good to see you. It's been a little while. It has been uh, a month since I've been on the show for reasons. Crazy. Good to have you back. All kinds of reasons. Yeah, great to be back. Also great to be back uh, with our guest who's joining us. Uh, I'm glad he, you are the, the person who I'm coming back to, Sean. Uh, Sean <laughs> Young, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer for Penn State Health and Penn State College of Medicine. Uh, in his role, he oversees all strategic marketing communications functions, for the organization's various hospitals and outpatient clinics, including its university teaching and research hospital. Hello, Sean. Hey, Chris, and wouldn't you know it, you know, I violated the first rule of Zoom. I, uh, I wasn't in 30 seconds and my cell phone started going off, so. Now, the first rule of Zoom is that you were unmuted. So you did have the first rule of Zoom down. That's yeah. the second rule, yeah. Well, <laughs> glad, glad you're here. Uh, looking forward to diving in with you. For those who don't know, Sean, how long have we known each other? Maybe a decade. Oh, I want to say it's been 10 years, maybe longer, uh, since the first Joe Public book came out. And uh, I read it on a plane and then called you afterwards and said, I need you to come out and talk to my senior team. <laughs> and shockingly, we still continue to work after that. So I guess that's a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> All oh, right. Well, looking forward to diving in. We're going to be talking to Sean about... Um, about marketing governance and what that means to, at his organization and how it relates to COVID-19, all that good stuff. But just a few housekeeping notes before we get there. Uh, if you are new to this podcast, uh, this is a show where we share industry trends, research, stories, uh, ideas, anything to help you navigate what we call the known normal. Uh, if you want to know more about what we mean by that, uh, Chase will post a, a link to a blog post that explains the no normal, some of the principles of the no normal, that type of thing in the chat uh, function of Zoom. So check that out for links that Chase will be posting as we go through this. Uh, I believe you can also talk to other folks. Chase, is that correct? We had somebody who corrected me on that. So I want to make sure when I say that, that it's a true <laughs> statement. You should be able to see and talk to other participants of the show in the chat yes. function. Yes, okay, you should be good. Able to. We've been saying that for about seven months now. So I'm glad, glad that's true. Uh, if you have a that's question- you like that. <laughs> yes, there you go. Thank you. Uh, if you have a question for Sean, if you have a question for me or Chase, that should go in the Q&A queue in Zoom. That's what we monitor to make sure that if there are questions, we answer them. There's always time at the end for questions, um, but I'll also monitor those and we may, get to those as we go if they're relevant to the to the conversation at hand. So just make sure if you have a question for us, you pop those in the Q&A function. Remember also, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, and know that every time we have a show, we post by the end of the day a video recording uh, of the show. So you can share that out or, or, or view it if you like, if you're listening to this but can't see it. Um, you can find that at our website. You can go to thinkrevivehealth.com slash COVID-19. Uh, one more just piece of housekeeping content for you before we get into the show. I'm not sure how many people who listen in on a regular basis or are coming to us um, for this show know that there's a part of Revive that goes beyond the branding and marketing we do for hospitals and health systems. Uh, that's a bulk of what we do at Revive Health, but we also have a specialty practice that focuses on helping providers when they are up against uh, a particularly difficult or hairy pair negotiation or contract that's coming down the road. In fact, that's where the, the firm got its start uh, 11 years ago, that was the work that was the bulk of the work. Now it's now it's a fraction of our work, but still we do it with dozens of systems every year. Uh, and we have uh, released a new resource based on that because, because of that work, uh, we spend a lot of time looking at payers and what they're doing, uh, really understanding how they show up in this world, how they show up in our industry, how they show up in relation to our primary clients, which is most of you, hospitals and health systems. Um, and it's not news to share that uh, a lot of what we've been seeing recently is not positive. 
Uh, we've been seeing you know, record profits from some insurers during COVID-19. Um, honestly, some of this kind of behavior has been going on far longer than just uh, this year in COVID-19. So we've pulled together a resource called Uncovered. So you can go to uncovered.health, that's the website. And that's where we're gonna be bringing in content and sharing feedback uh, on this aspect of our industry. Uh, we believe it deserves far more attention than it really is getting. Um, and, and that is the behavior that we see from insurers and how so much of that behavior is you know, not only good for the members and, and the consumers and the patients, not good for us in the industry, really not good for the country as a whole. So just invite you to check that out. You can also follow along on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, that's something that's going to be evergreen. We're going to be updating that, um, I guess, as long as there's payers, as long as we're in this business. So encourage you to check that out. All right. So Sean, let's dive in. And, you know, like I said, we were all set to talk about marketing governance and we will, uh, but I don't see how we don't at least take a second and pause and recognize uh, the really terrible milestones that we hit yesterday, three of them. Uh, so first of all, more hospitalizations in this country than ever before because of COVID-19 topping 100,000 for the first time as reported by the New York Times. Uh, cases are at, I mean, for the New York Times, it was like 12, 12 cases short of 200,000. Other sources reporting over 200,000 a day. It's the first time we've hit that mark. Uh, and then, you know, worst of all, we hit a, a death count yesterday, according to the New York Times, of 2,885, which breaks our record from back in April. Um, you know, it's just sad. It's scary. And we all know it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, it's just terrible that here we are in December and this is the, the news. You know, Sean, I don't know if what your take on all of that is. Um, love to hear from well, you. you. You know, we, we set up our daily calls with our leadership team across the system. So every afternoon at 4.30 in the afternoon, we discuss issues related from supplies to staffing to rates of infection we're seeing to testing, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I'm sure a lot of my colleagues around the country are doing the same thing at their healthcare institutions. And, and I think, you know, there's probably a number of things that are at play. Um, I don't know if it's, um, you know, sort of the political climate and this idea that I shouldn't have to wear a mask, I shouldn't have to social distance, people shouldn't tell me what to do, et cetera. And, you know, there may be a psychology associated with that. I'd love to hear what, what um, you know, behavioral health specialists have to say about, you know, fatigue of an, um, an environment like this and people just reaching a point where they care less about their own personal safety than they do about just sort of not having to deal with it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, or if it's just a question of, you know, do people think that the, you know, the vaccine is a silver bullet um, and because it's so close, they can just sort of relax a little bit. Uh, whatever it is um, that's contributing to it, the bottom line is it's, it's really scary. Um, you know, the models that we're looking at across central Pennsylvania um, are indicating to us that we may see another doubling of the caseload that we've currently got. And the caseload that we've currently got in our health system is significantly more than we had in the spring um, at the height of the pandemic, the alleged height of the pandemic. Um, and then on top of that, I mean, the irony of ironies, Chris, is the, the cell phone call I got when we started here was actually from my son's school to tell me we're now moving to all virtual learning because of the number of cases that have jumped up in his high school. Um, so, you know, it, it, it is scary. Um, you know, thankfully, we've got folks out there. I want to give a shout out to Samantha Arth and, and uh, Paul Matson at Cleveland Clinic um, for sort of spearheading the national mask up campaign that, that Penn State Health and about 120 other healthcare institutions have signed on for um, and is doing advertising around the country to try to reinforce the sort of civic responsibility almost that everybody has around masking up and social distancing and trying to stay on guard. But, but let's hope we do something to bend this curve because it's not looking good. No, it's not. And, and, you know, you can just go on and on with kind of the doom scrolling. The, the CDC leadership came out yesterday saying that they project an, another 180,000 deaths. So we would reach a total of 450,000 yeah. by February, which means we're likely at a half a million by sometime in the spring. Um, it's just that's just catastrophic. Uh, and you would hope that we can turn it around, but it, you know, to your point, there's so many different aspects that are preventing us from doing what we need to do. 
uh, that it just doesn't give us a lot of hope for that. But we've got to keep trying. And to your point, campaigns like the one Paul organized, uh, we've got other clients that are doing that in different markets. Uh, we just we have to we just have to keep going. We can't we can't give up um, in this industry on our side of things. Yeah, and I think I mean we're right now in the midst of trying to plan a virtual press briefing for the uh, media in our market um, for next week. Um, because we're getting the sort of same, I'll call them pedestrian questions that we were getting at the start where it was counting the number of ventilators was the story. And now it's counting the number of ICU beds. And, you know, we, we need to really help educate our, our media so that they can help educate the local citizens in the community appropriately. Um, you know, we've got a large sports arena that's near us. We could set up a 2000 bed hospital tomorrow if we wanted to start working on that. But the question is, who's going to staff it? And are the doctors and nurses available to staff it? Are they all healthy enough to provide the care? Um, so there's there's a lot of considerations here, and it's a much more complex issue than I think either the media or the general public really fully understand. Yeah, and you know this isn't the this isn't the fault of health systems, but I think maybe we can play a bigger role in helping people understand the Byzantine guidelines. I mean, part of this is because let's be frank, we don't have a national plan for this, so every state is left up to itself to figure this out, and so you get these conflicting guidelines, and sometimes even within states, right? So in my own state of Minnesota, we 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 you know the governor announced more restrictive guidelines. Um, a couple of weeks ago through, you know, the second week of December, I'm sure they'll extend. Um, but they included things like uh, closing down gyms, but you can still go to your hairdresser or we're still allowing people to go to church, which we know is a big, a big issue, right? There's a lot of dynamics to that. It would help be helpful to understand why, why is it okay to get my hair cut and not go to a bar or a restaurant? And I'm sure there are reasons, I think, I hope, there are reasons for that, but that's just within yeah. one state. If you go over to Wisconsin, it's different. Obviously, if you go to South Dakota, it's really different. Um, and that is not helping either. That is not helping people just go, okay, I can do this because it breaks down your trust in understanding what to do or whether it's even helpful. Yeah, and I think hospitals and health systems are conflicted a little bit too because, you know, one of those levers that the, you know, the uncoordinated national approach has has had is to focus on electives. And first of all, that you know, what's the definition of an elective? Um, you know, that's not 100% clear. People don't fully understand that in the public or in the press. And then secondly, you know, um, that is the economic engine for a lot of health systems. Um, but go beyond the business component of it. Let's talk about the fact that there are implications for delaying cancer care and heart care and hip replacement surgery and all of those things that could technically be labeled in some cases as electives. Um, so it, it, it's a challenge on so many levels. Yeah, I don't know, Chase, I wanna put you on the spot, but we did a, I think we did a blog post. Somewhere we have content about what, what Sean's talking about. We call it the the missing domino effect, which is you know, if, you t if people are not coming in for even preventative care or routine care, um, chronic care maintenance, that's usually the domino that will trigger downstream care that's so important, both to the patient to identify more acute needs that need to get taken care of, but also the financial um, livelihood of these hospitals and health systems that are missing that. Uh, and so the longer that, you know, we talked about that back in June, and now here we are again, um, the longer that that continues, the harder it is for us to get out of our, our financial hole. So um, you did find it. Way to go, Chase. You no, he's on his game. It was actually back game. in May that we posted. Oh my that goodness! Post. Yeah, still relevant, unfortunately. <laughs> All right, so let's move on because um, we really wanted to have you on to talk about this idea of marketing governance. And I want to give just a little bit of background because I love this. I love this, uh, Sean. We had you to, at our uh, Joe Public Retreat. That was not this year, but last year we talked about marketing. Yeah, it was uh, 2019 in Charleston. Yeah, yeah, it seems like forever ago. Uh, and it was a, this concept, Not I, I'm going to imagine not everybody's heard of it, and everybody's familiar with it, and certainly most systems don't have something like what you're going to describe. So we thought, what a great thing for you to get in front of this group of CMOs from around the country and talk about marketing and governance. Uh, we thought there'd be discussion on how you did it, the successes, the challenges, and there was. Uh, there was also something that was a surprise, which was a robust kind of discussion on 
why would you want to do this? Which I still just think is awesome. Um, and as you describe it, I think people maybe will get into it. Uh, the benefits are clear, but it was not something that yeah. we expected when we put it on the agenda. That it would be controversial. Yeah. Let's put it that yeah. way. So, so why yeah, don't you I remember start our just, friend Matt Gove sort of advocating, saying, "Don't do this. Why would you want to do this?" Shocker, right? Matt Gove being the contrarian yeah. and throwing the grenade in the room. But mm -hmm. it was great. It was a great conversation. So, why don't you start by just kind of explaining what you mean by marketing governance, uh, what it looks like in practice uh, at Penn State Health, and why you think it's valuable. Yeah, so so let me start by saying it's it's not a silver bullet. It's not a panacea, right? This is a this is an experiment that is an active experiment. Um, but we think there's been some value in it, and I'll sort of explain why that is. But I think Chris, first, what I ought to do is give people context because what marketing governance looks like in our organization for the shape and size of our organization might be different than what it looks like at a Cleveland clinic or a, you know, a U, UCSF or, or some other health system in another part of the country that's of different size and scale. Um, so you know, let's start with Penn State Health as a, a growing health system. So you know, as a healthcare enterprise in our current, current form, we're only about five years old. Um, all the institutions that are part of Penn State Health have been around for you know, 50 to 100 years, but the system itself is only five years old. It's about a 2.6 to a 3.0 billion dollar health system in central PA. Um, we're across roughly 10 or 12 counties with our hospitals and clinics. Our flagship is the Milton S. Hershey Medical Center, which I'm sure most people have heard of based in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And that campus includes our children's hospital, Penn State Children's Hospital. Uh, it's also the campus, the main campus of the Penn State College of Medicine. Our university is not in Hershey. We're not like Ohio State and, and a lot of other large university health systems. We're not co-located with the university campus. We're about two hours away from Penn State, which is in State College. You know, we've also got St. Joseph Medical Center in Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, we just acquired Holy Spirit Medical Center uh, in Camp Hill on the West Shore of Harrisburg uh, on November 1st from, from Geisinger. Uh, we're building two new community hospitals, Lancaster Medical Center in Lancaster and Hamden Medical Center in uh, Mechanicsburg, Cumberland County, which is like the fastest growing county in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and we've got the Penn State Health Medical Group, which has community physicians and academic physicians in separate practices, operates about 80 or so outpatient locations across 10 counties. So, you know, with that context in mind, you know, keep, you know, first of all, you get a sense that we're growing really, really fast. And when you're growing really fast like that, decision-making structures tend to be nascent and constantly evolving. And, you know, there are questions about who needs to weigh in on things. And the last thing you want to do is, you know, issue a new marketing campaign or unleash a new communication strategy uh, change an entire website infrastructure and have key leaders go, well, why wasn't I consulted? Or why wasn't I at least informed? So about two and a half years ago, um, I put a proposal in front of a couple of key leaders of the organization that basically was, let's take those key leaders. Let's put them in a room together once a month. Let's sit them down for an hour. Every quarter, we'll extend that meeting to 90 minutes so we can get into really substantive issues. Um, and let's talk to them about the issues that are important to marketing that we either need their, their buy-in on or we need their awareness of or we want their expertise and guidance um, or support. Uh, and so, you know, it's been a little bit of trial and error. There have been some things that haven't really worked, and there have been some things where we've gotten really good buy-in and support and, and information, um, and we continue to refine it as we go. We're kind of in that storming, forming, norming phase, and I'd say we're still in that forming phase. How was, how was the uh, idea received by leadership when you first posed it? So I would say it was met with a combination of curiosity um, and uh, initial trepidation, like I'm going to give up an hour of my time for this and is it going to be worth my time? Um, but I think there was enough of a sense from the leaders that one, they wanted to have a voice, right? They didn't want to have things completely dictated to them from on high. Um, and secondly, you know, I think they all understand that marketing and communications is an important function that covers a lot of different facets. 
uh, and that because the organization was constantly evolving and leadership structures were still sh taking shape, um, that it was probably good for them to get together once a month and talk about key marketing issues. Um, I will say that, you know, we, we've constantly asked for feedback. Was this a good use of your time? Is there something we could, we could do differently or better? Are there other issues you'd like us to bring here? Um, or was this an issue we shouldn't have bothered you with? Um, and so, you know, we've gotten that feedback. They've given us input and it's continued to shape how we put the agenda together. Um, and um, so I think it's been productive from that sense. Um, and I think everybody does sort of see, hey, it's a good opportunity to get together and talk about these things. And at a minimum, just be informed and aware of what's going on in the marketing and communications world. You know, at one point, Sean, um, you shared with me a, a story or an example. You don't have to share this exact one or even remember what it was. But part of the challenge, as we know, as marketing folks and leaders is there's a, we run into walls oftentimes with what we can do because there's something that that has to be decided at a higher level. It could be an mm -hmm. operational thing. It could be uh, something to do with the consumer experience. Who knows what it is? Um, and you had talked about the value of having these folks already booked to be in a room. So you could just throw that on the table instead of trying to chase all of them down. And oftentimes, you know, separately, which causes its own problem because you get into a he said, she said. Um, can you, if you know what I'm talking about, can you think of an example yeah. where you've been able to take something like that and get a resolution uh, to help you move things forward? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you a really practical example um, and then sort of give you some additional context around how the, the governance team is structured so we know yeah. who's weighing in. Um, so, so first, the, the membership of our governance group is the presidents of our hospitals. So right now we've got uh, five hospitals, um, two being built, um, three, that, uh, three others that exist. Um, and you know, if I include the Children's Hospital, the president of Hershey Medical Center is also the president of the Children's Hospital. So we've got the hospital leaders covered. And then the medical group, which is the practice that includes both academic and community docs, we've got the senior physician leaders of the academic practice and the community practice at the table. The chief of staff of the CEO is there. Um, and then our chief strategy officer, uh, Tom Stasel, and Peter Dillon, Dr. Dillon, is our chief clinical officer for the whole system. That's the governance group. Um, so we've got a combination of physician and administrative leaders. The CEO, you'll note, is not there. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that he then becomes the appeal mechanism or the validation mechanism, right? So we don't waste his time with large group discussions where you know everybody's deliberating and he's part of the deliberation. We let everybody deliberate and then we decide, is this something that needs to go to Steve? And if we think it's something that needs to be taken, we figure out who from the team needs to take it to him for blessing, review, input, whatever. Um, and we let him know, hey, governance has discussed this and this is what we conclude. So it, it makes his life easier on some things uh, in some ways. So I'll give you one example. We have a, a member of that governance group who's having active conversations um, with private practice groups. And those private practice groups climb the walls when they see us marketing in their backyard, allegedly stealing their patients, right? And so while he's in conversations with these practice groups about trying to get them to work with us and collaborate with us on some things, you know, he'd prefer that we're not dropping campaigns in their backyard while those conversations are happening. But I have another hospital president who needs volume and wants to drive volume to a particular program and the volume needs to come from those geographies. So instead of letting marketing, you know, be caught in the middle, um, you know, there's that that old Lord of the Rings quote uh, about, you know, wizards and, and somebody spoofed it and said, you know, do not meddle in the affairs of dragons because you're crunchy and you taste good with ketchup. Um, that's what a lot of our frontline marketing teams find themselves in the middle of. You know, you take a frontline junior middle career marketing specialist, client strategist, and you put them in between a department chair and a hospital president or between two hospital presidents they're going to get eaten for lunch, right? They're going to get direction from two people who believe that individual should be listening to exactly what they say, and they're caught between a rock and a hard place. So instead, we took that issue to the marketing governance group, and we let those leaders hash it out and discuss it. And then, you know, other folks had a chance to weigh in. 
Um, and then ultimately we walked away with direction where we said, no, we are gonna market in that backyard. For the person who's having the conversations with the practice groups, you tell them, look, this is what we need to do. You guys aren't currently partnering with us. You aren't currently working with us. We need to go get our volume. And I'm sorry it's happening in your backyard. I'm just gonna give you a fair warning that it's happening. Um, and if you wanna have a different conversation about how you might work with us or collaborate with us that might induce us not to, or convince us not to be so aggressive, um, you know, maybe we can talk through what those things are. Um, obviously, we, you know, within the reason of Stark and all those other kinds of things, you know, competition is competition. Um, but there are obviously ways that are, you know, approved and supported for how, you know, practices can partner with health systems and, and vice versa. Um, but it was nice because it gave us an opportunity to settle out how we were going to do it. And then everybody was on the same page. So it creates awareness of something. It also creates the sort of resolution of agendas. <laughs> Um, because the other thing that happens at times is it's not just getting conflicting guidance from leaders that can sometimes occur, um, but it's also this idea of publicly I'm going to say one thing, but behind the scenes I'm going to say something else, right? Um, when you surface those things at marketing governance and the decision has been made, now everybody has high cover to say, we talked about this, you were in the meeting, we were all there, we all agreed to this. Um, you know, fortunately at Penn State Health, we don't have leaders, uh, you know, in my experience who, who play the hidden agenda game. Most folks are pretty on, on top of the, you know, the table about what their concerns are. But for organizations that might have that issue, it's one way to get at it without putting the marketing people in the position of trying to, you know, play a shell game. They should just come to Minnesota. I mean, we're the land of the <laughs> passive aggressive. So, so that's a dynamic in the Midwest for sure. Do you yeah. mind, Sean, really quickly, just if you would share with people as specific or general as you want to be the structure of your marketing department, how many people, um, you know, are they, is it all centralized? Do you have them in different areas? Yeah. So it's, it's largely centralized. Um, we have a, um, roughly give or take a few 40 person team. Now that 40 person team, includes members in an in-house print shop who, you know, run the mechanics of operating a print operation. It includes some, some design staff um, who do our graphic design work um, on the digital and the, and the print and traditional space. Um, we have a content team which handles, you know, all myriads of communications and content. So that social media, video, photography, um, copy for ads and marketing materials, copy for websites, um, you know, media relations, internal and corporate communications, that sort of thing. And we have a client strategy team, which really oversees the brand strategy and works with our media buyer on placement of, of media uh, and develops, you know, campaigns and concepts and strategy to advance the needs of clients, whether that's grow volume or increase awareness of the new service or introduce something to a, to a community where something hasn't existed before, et cetera. And then we've got a, a digital engagement and consumer perception team. So um, some folks know Jerry Griffin, our director of, of um, consumer and, and digital engagement. And Jerry oversees, you know, um, uh, our, you know, our CRM system. He oversees the web, um, both the internal uh, intranet and the uh, external uh, web presences. Um, and, and that sort of stuff. So that's, that's largely the team. And like I said, it's about 40 deep. And then we've got individuals at the regions. Um, so um, at our Holy Spirit Medical Center, we've got a director of marketing and communications for that region, who's the person on the ground that interfaces with the hospital presidents and leaders on that side. We've got um, some folks in the Berks and Lancaster region who interface with the leaders there who are our boots on the ground. And, and they're really important to give us regional context, right? So you know, the biggest challenge of a shared service is you sit in one central location and you try to make decisions about an entire geographic footprint. Um, and sometimes you're missing nuances. Um, and for us in central Pennsylvania, that's critical. You know, for, for my colleagues located in urban centers, you know, you tend to think concentric circles, right? It's city, and then you work your way out to the suburbs, but most of it is oriented around the culture of that city, whereas central Pennsylvania is really four or five mid-sized cities of about 80,000 to 100,000 population, 
and each one is the center of its individual county. So there's really four or five nuanced geographies within our market. So one size doesn't fit all. So that regional component is pretty important to us. All right, thanks. That's that's helpful, I'm sure, for folks to kind of get context. One of the things that you um, shared with us that I want to ask you about that I think is super interesting is the idea of archetypes uh, and how those relate to, to marketing governance. So tell us what you mean there. Give us some examples of archetypes and how they relate to what you're trying to do. Yeah, so, you know, it's... It, I'm kind of a little bit of a marketing philosophy junkie. Um, and so, you know, if, if, if you're in this space, you're all familiar with the kinds of marketing and brand archetypes and you can, you know, plug a company or an organization into a particular type of brand. You know, Apple is one thing and Mercedes is another and McDonald's is yet another. Um, and those archetypes tend to be things like, you know, um, magician or wizard or, you know, ruler or king or, you know, hero or lover, you know, and, and that sort of stuff. So I started thinking about what are the archetypes for interacting with a marketing governance structure? Because not everything we bring to marketing governance is the same sort of box of stuff, right? Sometimes we want them to weigh in on policy because we really need to get a bunch of bad apples in line. You know, there's an uncoordinated or Wild West sort of situation going on and we need marketing governance to give us the teeth to enforce a practice. Um, in some cases, we need change to happen within the organization um, or we need access to information. And so we might be coming at them to sort of help make that change happen and, and sort of advocate for us. Um, in other cases, we're trying to resolve disputes between countries. You know, this hospital wants to do this and this hospital wants to do that. Um, you know, so-and-so needs more labor and delivery volume, but we can't steal it from our other hospital that's 20 minutes away. So how do we figure out what the strategy is for doing that in a way that everybody can get on board? Um, so the archetypes that, that I've been thinking through, and I don't, this is not fully baked, this is a work in progress, but I've kind of come up with a couple so far. So one is the diplomat, right? And that's the, the don't meddle in the affairs of dragons stuff, right? How do you get the frontline marketing people out of the middle of disputes that they shouldn't be playing in, right? So the diplomat is where, you know, you resolve issues out in the open, you keep marketing from being eaten alive, you get a confirmation step from leaders that yes, everybody's heard this and everybody's agreed to this, and you build consensus around messaging or policy or priorities or strategy. So, you know, when you put something on the agenda, one of the things I try to think about is, what role are we playing here? Okay, here we're playing the diplomat. So let's bring a diplomatic tone, a diplomatic mindset. The end game is a diplomatic solution, right? In other cases, we're the informer, right? I'm, I'm the spy giving a report. I'm, I'm doing a simple sit rep. Um, you know, it's about creating awareness of needs and challenges. It's about keeping leaders on the same page. It's often about keeping them from being surprised. Um, and position them to articulate to the people who work for them, no, that's not a dumb marketing campaign. Let me tell you what's behind it, because I was in the presentation. Um, or here's why we're not talking about our technology, and instead we're talking about the expertise of our physicians. Or why we're using patient testimonials as opposed to, you know, physicians with their arms crossed and white coats and scrubs. Um, right. Right. Uh, and then there's the advocate, um, and we use this with social media governance. So um, we, we went through a whole process with social media because like a lot of other of our partners out there, we have a lot of individuals who think they know what social media is in a healthcare marketing setting because they have their own Facebook page at home or because they post their favorite articles on Twitter. Um, and they don't understand that the level of responsiveness, the messaging, um, you know, the, the type of content that's appropriate and everything else for an organization is very different than a personal account. Um, and, you know, and I know it's happening at other institutions because, you know, and it's probably happened to my colleagues, you know, you'll get a department chair or a physician leader or an administrator who will show up and say, well, this competitor is doing this. I just got their Twitter feed or, you know, I'm on their Facebook page. Why aren't we doing this? Um, you know, I want to stand up a Facebook page. Never mind that we've already got 60,000 eyeballs on ours. You're going to set up one from scratch and do it on your own and completely 
ignore the basic rules of editorial calendars and so forth and so on. Um, so what we did was we brought the issue to marketing governance and said, we think we have a problem and we think this problem is a liability to the organization. Um, and here's why. Um, and we'd like to get an internal audit done. So we went to the internal audit department and we had the internal audit do a soup to nuts review. And they basically took that audit to the board of directors and said, here's the liability the organization is facing because you don't have mechanisms in place to control social media and people can set up whatever they want and so forth and so on. Um, and, you know, from that came the directive from the CEO and the Dean of the College of Medicine that says, get a team together, give us a plan, let's go through this. And sort of we kept bringing this back to marketing governance every so often to the point now that we have a formal social media oversight group that's made up of clinical and administrative leaders of the organization from different parts of the organization. We're setting policy in place. We're setting training protocols in place. In fact, I think we've got the next meeting of that group this afternoon. Um, but that was the advocate part of, of this role, which was putting that group in a position to say, go forward and make this happen because you are protecting the organization and we'll, we'll provide you with high cover. And then I, I think the last one I can think of is sort of this validator, or validator role. So, you know, a lot of people look at the NRC consumer perception data. You know, we have a process in place where every three months to six months, we take our latest findings about brand perception to the, the senior leadership group at the marketing governance group and say, this is what people are saying about us. This is what they're saying about our competitors. This is how it's moved or not moved. Um, or we'll take, you know, individual campaigns or projects to them and say, you know, we did this event or we did this campaign and here's what we got out of it. This is what the numbers are telling us. Here's how many attendees we had or how many HRAs we got completed or how many patients we can track back to this campaign. Um, so it gives them a means of sort of saying, okay, marketing's doing something. They're not just out there making stuff look pretty. They're actually producing some results. So right. those are just a couple of the archetypes. That's great. And I, and I love that you're honest about that it's an experiment, but I think it's, it's something we don't talk about very often in marketing in the different roles that you play, not just with marketing governance, but um, maybe in, in other situations too, an idea of proactively embracing that and saying, hey, today we got to show up as the, as the fire starter. We're going to have to really you know, set some, light some butts on fire, really get some movement versus the diplomat, which is a completely different tenor, mm -hmm. a completely different agenda, all that kind of thing. So um, we've got one question. I'm going to hold it to the end here. Uh, because I want to, I want to have you address, if you could, how marketing governance has served you, or if there are challenges that you've encountered during 2020 and the and the pandemic. In what ways? Yeah, it I, I think you? Chris, one of the regrets we had was that during COVID, you know, I said we've been at this for about two and a half years. The reality is we missed about four marketing governance meetings because COVID the number one priority and everybody was tunneled in on those those issues. Um, so we did have to suspend some of the meetings, um, which which was unfortunate. But we were also able to use it to sort of come back and, and get validation for some internal communications changes we made. So our director of content and communications, uh, Megan Manlove, she stood up a lot of things with her team during COVID, um, you know, we changed our daily internal email um, news uh, item um, to what we called the COVID update. So we sort of pushed a lot of the other corporate communication stuff down the page or off the page. And we really made this all about, hey, we've changed the policy. There's an update on where you can get fit testing for masks. We're, you know, we're revising visitation, whatever it might be. That became sort of a daily thing that we put out. And then the, the ga other gap that we recognized was that we were communicating really broadly to everybody in the organization, but there was a work stream that managers really needed. Um, they needed to know things in many cases before the employees who were finding things out from the COVID update, the daily brief. So we created a new vehicle um, called Managers Update. Um, and it, it, both of these things link back to our infonet and our website, and we can do certain things like, you know, track open rates. And, you know, uh, if there were stories with links, we can track back the links and see who's reading what and how much activity we're getting. Um, 
but the manager update became this whole sort of new work stream. Um, and so we needed to go in front of, of uh, marketing governance and sort of sync up two things. One, there was a communication audit we put in front of them. We, we brought in a firm to evaluate what we were doing that was working and reaching people and what we weren't doing right or where we were missing things. And so some of the things we ended up implementing in COVID were a direct result of that communications audit. You know, the manager's update, um, the, the change to this daily brief. So some of these vehicles, we were well positioned. We had them in place and functioning by the time COVID hit because we had used marketing governance to validate the findings of the communication audit and say, yeah, you can budget for that. Or yeah, I think that makes sense, et cetera, et cetera. And I know like, for example, I've talked to the president of our, our Hershey Medical Center and she tells me, you know, it's, it's appointment reading for her every day. Um, she's sometimes quoting articles from the materials we're sending out that I haven't even looked at yet. Um, you know, she's getting to it before I am. So, you know, I, we know that it's reaching some people and that people are using it as a tool to communicate to their staff. Um, and so COVID was sort of a way to set the stage for that. And then when we launched it to sort of come back and get a validation and say, you know, we stood this manager's update thing up because we thought we needed it in COVID. Should we keep doing it and make it part of our basic operations? And can we get support for that? And the answer was, yeah, we think it's working and we see value in it. So go ahead. Yeah, this is, this is, I'm going to draw an illusion real quick to just kind of tie things together. And then I want to get to the question where I mentioned before, there's a, there was controversy when, when we first raised this at Joe Public, right? And the controversy was, um, why would you want to ask your leadership's opinion of these things. Um, and again, I think it was coming from one or two people that that had somehow figured out a way to either not have to do that or not care about doing that. But I, I think it's safe to say that the vast majority of people in your role, Sean, don't have the luxury of ignoring their leadership or doing whatever the heck you want to do. <laughs> so that the benefit seems pretty obvious um, in that regard. And I think those are great examples. But I, I do want to ask you something. And this is a question from some of the audience, but it's related to this. You mentioned you had your chief clinical officer in the group. We all know that physicians from time to time have opinions on marketing. You know, it happens every once in a while. Um, and in particular, at AMC, you got faculty where, you know, multiply that mm -hmm. by 10. So how do you incorporate or do you even try to incorporate the voice of other physicians who aren't in the committee? Um, or does it, is it just not something you're trying to do and you're, you come at it a different way with that group? So, so let me, we are a physician, you know, in many ways, a physician led organization, like many of yours are. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to color this picture even darker from the outside in, uh, and then, and then illuminate it after that. Um, keep in mind that our chief clinical officer is a surgeon that our senior vice president for academic practice is a neurosurgeon. Um, and the, the senior vice president for community practice is a family medicine doc. Okay, so divergent opinions. But, you know, when you're talking to a neurosurgeon and a surgeon, you know, there might be a default belief that, you know, these guys are going to be put my face on a billboard kind of thing. Docs need to see themselves, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, to their credit, I would say they, 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 um, they pass beyond that archetype with flying colors. Um, you know, Dr. Harbot and Dr. Dillon and Dr. Bird have been valuable members of that group. Um, and they've, they've been really good about leaving their hat at the door, um, you know, for their individual department or their specialty. But because they are in the roles that they're in as physician leaders of other physicians, you know, they know when to call out and say, hey, can we get this in front of the department chairs at Hershey Medical Center? Um, can we take this forward to other groups of physicians to get their input or their buy-in? But they also serve as advocates. So, you know, we just launched a brand new website November 1st. Um, Penn State Health didn't have a health system website. It was a cacophony of eight different hospital websites that were on different platforms that didn't integrate and talk to each other. And so we blew that up and rewrote it and reworked it and everything else. And as part of that, we put a steering committee together. And the chair of the steering committee was the neurosurgeon, who's the senior vice president for academic practice. And he was indispensable in sort of killing the kind of, you know, sort of nonsense arguments that usually come up about, well, why isn't this on the website? Or why aren't you highlighting my, 
you know, my message about my department or why aren't we talking about this award more, um, you know, to sort of say, hey, the users are consumers, et cetera, et cetera. So the governance structure in and of itself isn't a silo. It also contributes to other groups that um, help you manage this. And so that steering committee, which was made up of other leaders of, of you know, the clinical operations and so forth on the website, that became another means of managing this vis-a-vis -vis the, the governance structure. Um, so they, they carry some of that water for us. And then I would also say this wasn't an overnight thing. Like we didn't just stand up governance, put a bunch of physician leaders on it and say, voila, well, all of our problems are now solved. And this was years in the making. Um, every single one of those physician leaders, Chris, you presented to six, seven, eight years ago when we talked about why Joe Public doesn't care about your hospital. You know, we've had the conversation that no one drives past a billboard and goes, oh, that brain surgery looks neat. I'll get one today, right? Um, you know, so we've spent a lot of time inculcating that sort of thinking with our leadership and turning them into advocates so that when somebody says, well, I don't have my own Facebook page, I'm losing patience because of that, the leaders go, no, you're not. <laughs> Just stop and work with marketing and it'll be fine, right? Um, so so I, I think it's important for people to know that we did a lot of care and feeding before we just threw this group together that, you know, I bought them copies of Joe Public and gave them all Joe Public copies to read. You know, we spent time in meetings going through why things work and why things don't work and so forth. All right. Fantastic. We're just at time. There's a quick question that's completely kind of sideways, but it's based on something you asked. Do you mind sharing what CMS platform you guys leverage for your new site? Our, our, oh, CMS. We worked with the firm yeah. Center Tech, um, and they we, we partnered with them for a couple of reasons. Um, I mean, uh, beyond the normal cost and service components. Um, one, they had a lot of experience working with Cerner and integrating Cerner um, into their website, and we're a Cerner house for the most part, so um, they made sense from that perspective. And secondly, they had experience, a good blended experience of working with both academic and community uh, hospitals and organizations. I think one of their clients was University of Missouri Health System. Um, and so because of that, I think we just thought they'd be a good fit for us. So that's a proprietary CMS, not Sitecore or... Yeah, um, I, I would actually have to ask uh, my head of web, you know, what platform it's sure. on. Um, so off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you what it is. I don't believe it's open source technology. Um, right. Somebody's, somebody's answering for us that it's Drupal. So you Drupal. can confirm that, okay. but yep. thank you to our own attendees thank you, Larry. for answering the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's go ahead and wrap. I think that's a good place to wrap. Sean, really appreciate you coming. It's, you know, we should have had you on much sooner given how long you and I have been batting this kind of stuff around. So I appreciate mm -hmm. you joining us today. Now, always glad to do it, Chris. And uh, again, I know not one size fits all, but hopefully people gleaned enough from this conversation that they can figure out how it might map to their own organizations and be useful. Yeah, yeah. Super, super helpful information for sure. Chase, thank you as always. Absolutely. Enjoyed the conversation. Excellent. If you would, if you would like to cover something, uh, pop it in the chat channel right now. You can send us an email at no normal at thinkrevivehealth.com. Next week, we're excited to have another longtime friend of mine, Dana Allen, who is Chief Marketing Communications Officer at Norton Healthcare. Uh, and she's going to talk about their approach to racial justice and health disparities in their community uh, based in Louisville, Kentucky. So that, really looking forward to that conversation. Remember, visit thinkrevivehealth.com slash COVID-19 for a recording of today's episode. Uh, also, all of our content on COVID-19 is there, and there is a ton of it. Uh, so make sure you check that out if you need help. Subscribe to us on iTunes. Check out that new resource that I mentioned before, uncovered.health. Uh, and until next week, good luck out there in the no normal. <laughs>